Um, I'm going to talk about an interface called XCAP. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to show you what it's all about. Uh, we created a kind of catchy title. Uh, hopefully, I can uh, fill you up to that. Uh, let's see. Um, I want to start out with what XCAP is all about, and there is a nice little saying which goes a little bit different, but you can exchange packets with uh, Prophet and Wireshark with Mount, and then you get it. So if the packets won't come to Wireshark, Wireshark has come to the packets. That's basically what XCAP is all about. We want to find packets or get packets into Wireshark which not necessarily have been meant to be in Wireshark or on a network at all. So the data we are after is either not residing on the network we're capturing, is not residing on the machine we're capturing from or we're capturing on. We want to do it using a UI because let's face it, and I'm saying this especially with Saka sitting in front of me, a UI is much more nicer looking than a command line interface. <laughs> Uh, we want to capture data, for example, which is not networky at all. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of data today, nowadays has never been intended to be on networks, like control data from, I don't know, AC controls, uh, power stations, stuff like that. Data that was never meant to be networked at all. RF frequencies, communication on RF frequencies, 433 megahertz, for instance, 868 megahertz, for instance. Then there is data which actually doesn't make sense at first glance to have it captured in Wireshark, like system events and system logs. But think of it that way. You're developing an application, you're tracing a problem with an application on a certain machine. And not only see the network trace generated by the application, but at the same time you also see what system events have appeared right before this message was sent or right after this message was sent. And so it makes it much more easier to go down to the root cause of an issue if you can get this together. And as I mentioned before, RF environments, those are easily not networky at all because usually they're just a single burst message, probably responded by another burst message, and those uh, we want to see for whatever reason. Before we go down that path, there is one little infrastructure we have to get out of the way. Usually when you fire up Wireshark and you capture with Wireshark, all you do is you start Wireshark, right? Well, for those of you who have been with Wireshark with the program for a bunch of years, in the past we had issues with that. And the reason we have issues with that is because there are different system elevated levels on your machine. So in the past you had a Wireshark version which only the system administrator can use because only he had the right to capture, for instance. Um, so, so, quite a long time ago, we separated the capturing engine, the real capture happening, from the display. And this, this separation is done by using a utility called DumpCap. DumpCap is running on all of your machines, neither if you're on Windows, Linux, Mac, doesn't matter. And it usually is the only utility that has system rights which is kind of neat because all that stuff done in Wireshark could potentially also be security problematic. We generate filters, we compile filters, we do a lot of other stuff with it, but this is never done with system rights. This is always done just with user level rights. Dump code is the only one that really knows how to capture data, which in effect means also that Wireshark only knows how to get data from dump cap. Wireshark knows nothing else. If it's not from dump cap, then Basically, Wireshark can't load it for the purpose of this talk. So all interfaces must go through DumpCap, and all our so-called XCAP interfaces must go through it as well. And for that reason, we have one particular issue. We're only capturing PCAP and PCAP and cheap. That doesn't mean that the original form or the original thing you're capturing is something else, but you have to transform it through PCAP to, to PCAP and PCAP and cheap to be able to see it in Wireshark. And that was also the original ident identification and, and idea behind the XCAP interfaces, because there are a bunch of utilities out there who can create PCAPs. It's not only just the utilities using the PCAP, but if you take Sysdic, a utility to create system dumps, for instance, they can dump the system dump using PCAP and G format. And so there's a lot of third-party utilities out there who can create PCAP traces, and, well, 
they usually do it using pipes, and the end of the pipe is usually the end of the capture. What that means, I come to in a second. So how is it all happening? Well, Wireshark, when it boots up, asks for interfaces. That's the stuff you see at the, uh, at the start of Wireshark. There's a loading all interfaces message going through, or at the bottom at, at 2.4. It then creates configuration dialogues for all the interfaces, especially for XCAP interfaces. And then it starts the utility with a pipe. And XCAP then uses dumpcap to create the information. Now, how is this working? Dumpcap understands pipes. Pipes was the original idea of capturing data which is not happening on a network interface. So it's very easy. Every operating system has pipes. They're very easy to handle. Take Linux, for example. You create a so-called uh, named pipe. In this call, is Shrugfin. You start Wireshark and tell him, listen to this pipe. And then, you, in this case, you start a remote process using an SSH engine and call on the SSH uh, system uh, dump cap with a certain capture. You want to capture here on, on with using this capture filter and dump the information to Sharkfin. And suddenly you can see the traffic from another machine in Wireshark. Well, this is neat, right? This is simple, this is easy to use. The thing is, this is Linux. I'm not gonna show you the Windows example, but the smallest one I could find, I, I think 100 lines of code because Windows has a completely different understanding of, of pipes. And as Wireshark is a cross-platform program, we have issues with that. A lot of things can go wrong with this approach, though. One of these things that can go wrong is not necessarily are you able to start the capture, stop the capture, restart the capture when it, when it, when, once it was initiated. The second thing that can go wrong is pipes can be broken, pipes can be destroyed, you don't have the necessarily the rights to create a pipe, to create a pipe properly, to create a pipe to be able to read from where you want it to be read. And what also can go wrong is you're on Windows. Now that's a problem to begin with, but still, it can't be helped. Apparently some people want to use it. Graham is scratching his head. And also, if you want to reconfigure your capture, uh, take back this example with the SSH case. If you want to reconfigure your capture, let's say you want to have a different filter, you want to have uh, a different port setup, you want to read from a different remote interface, then you have to restart the whole process again. And in some cases, this means stopping the capture program, destroying the pipe, closing Wireshark, adding a new pipe, adding, starting up Wireshark again, starting the capture program again. This is cumbersome. And for a daily investigation of, let's say, a switch system or anything, um, that's really not useful. So the solution to all of that is called XCAP. Now, XCAP stands for External Capture Interfaces, and it was introduced quite a while ago uh, on Sharkfest 2013 by two guys called Mike Kershaw and Mike Ryan. If you ever have the ability to go to Sharkfest US, go to Mike Kershaw's talk. It will scare the shit out of you even more than Phil does when he does his security talks, but it's worth it. He really knows what he's talking about, and he did Kismet. Kismet is a utility for capturing Wi-Fi traffic all over the place, and he pretty much looks like Phil, by the way. I'm not really sure. I've never seen two of them in the same room. They, they have some similar, maybe they're the same person. I really have no clue. <laughs> the evil twin, the more metal music loving twin, I think. <laughs> Uh, Mike Ryan works also for a company that does Wi-Fi and stuff like that. And they needed, they had a tool, it's Kismet, and they needed to get the traffic from Kismet into Wireshark, which was easy enough using pipes, as I just demonstrated, but they had a lot of configuration going on with Kismet. They needed to select channels, they needed to select certain filters, they needed to select certain interfaces. And by changing those stuff, all they had to do was close Wireshark, close the pipe, open the pipe, open Wireshark all over again. And so investigating a certain issue really got problematic. Since Wireshark 2.0, XCAP is now part of the Wireshark standard distribution. You might have seen it. Those are the annoying little interfaces that show up in your interface with a round symbol in front of it. Uh, called things like Randpunk dump, Cisco dump, SSH dump, those are all XCAP interfaces. 
And the mission statement for all of those interfaces is the same thing. Utilize the pipe interface and make a nice GUI for it. That's basically all an XCAP utility does. We got nothing else than a nice way of using the pipe system already in place and having a UE for it. With that, we can do a lot of different things. We can, for instance, start, stop, and restart captures, doing it live like it would be a native interface. It doesn't really matter what we're having is, uh, behind it. it. It can be, in case of Cisco dump, it SSHs into a Cisco box, and you can select an interface from Cisco and capture on it. SSH dump does the same to any SSH enabled system. You can even select a command that's going to get executed on the remote system. So you don't necessarily have to use dump cap or TCP dump. You can pretty much execute anything you want. As long as it's dumping PCAP, you're fine. The second thing is handle interface configuration. Now I'm going to show you in a minute how such an interface dialog can look like. But the thing is, most users really don't like command line operations. They're useful, they're handy, and they're scriptable. But the thing is, uh, usually just by looking at the options, you really don't get a sense how you, should, you can work around it, what you can do with them. And the last thing is, and this is actually a really neat thing, it's called handle runtime control. Now, when a capture is running, you usually not expect to do anything with it. But there's a nice guy, a core developer, uh, who cr works for a company that creates Bluetooth. Of chips and have a nice little Bluetooth sniffer which costs about a buck and they have an XCAP interface for it and during a live capture you can switch the Bluetooth channel you can switch the devices you can listen in on one device and without ever stopping the capture so you can search industry and what you where you want to go when you finally pick this place you want to go then you uh, then you restart the capture with the configuration and you go with it now Wireshark works, um, the XCAP interfaces work basically as command line utilities. Each XCAP interface is a single command line utility which can be called from the command line, which can be called with a FIFO buffer attached to it, and just be like any other pipe interface out there. There is nothing specific to it. There is no magic behind it, and there is no Wireshark specifics to it. And that's on purpose. We want these utilities to be utilized in such a way that if your company or if your, your project creates a utility that already does PCAP capture, all you have to add is a little bit of glue code and make this utility native to the Wireshark environment. So it's built in such a way that you have to have as least work possible to create an interface. And the first thing you always have to do is you have to tell the system what kind of interfaces do you have? This here is xcapexample.py, which is part of the Wireshark source code. So you can start it right now. You can add it to your Wireshark system. I'm going to show you in a minute how it's done. And when I call it on the, inter on the command line interface, I see, first of all, the name of the pr uh, program. In this case, we just called it xcap because it's the example program. We're going to show you that the version. Then you can provide a help page, which can be local or remote and you can say what it's called on the system. And this little utility then provides interfaces. So you not only have the possibility to uh, have one XCAP providing one interface, you can have one XCAP providing 20 or 30 or 40. There is one XCAP utility in the Wireshark distribution which gets installed on, uh, on default. It's called Android Dump if you are on Linux. And what Android Dump does is when you have the Android CLI installed, the, the development CLI installed, and you attach an Android phone with Wireshark, you are able to capture the network interface of Android, Bluetooth interface Android, system dump Android. You can have the whole development experience you usually use for the Android development environment in Wireshark. Now this is neat, right? There's another utility in the making which for whatever reason we haven't yet submitted, that's called Linux dump. You can do the same for Linux. So you can have a utility which natively dumps all the syslog, all the sysdig information, and stuff like that. The second thing you have to do is, after you have an interface, I have two interfaces here. One is called example one, the other one is called example two. They have a nice little name to them. 
The second thing you have to do is you have to provide a configuration. We want to emphasize that you really should do a configuration just because it's cool looking and nice. And it's easy for the end user to have a nice little dialog here which enables him to configure whatever he wants to do. Now this is the example dialog. So obviously we have added all possible configuration options to this dialog. You have a bunch of them. You can uh, have options for integers, text, booleans. That's this for instance, this little verify here is a boolean. You can, but you also can have selections for radio, for multi-check. You have a password selection in here. You have a password input field, which, which is hashed out. Be advised, however, that we store the configuration, and this will be stored in real text. So there is no password protection behind it. It's just that you don't see it on the front screen. Um, you can enter IP addresses, for instance. What you can also do is you can put regular expressions behind every input so that you can check for certain configurations. Um, or have ranges or whatever. You can have mandatory fields. For instance, this field up here is red, which says please enter message here. So before you start any capture, you have to enter a field. When you have entered all the fields, you can opt to save those parameters and capture start. The next time you start the capture, it will start with exactly the same parameters, except for the password. If you need a password, then you have to re-enter it. And you start. Yeah, so you also can uh, opt to throw away the passwords, uh, the, the stored parameters. Those are being stored in the normal parameter, uh, preference section. So if you go to Edit Preferences, Advanced Preferences, uh, you can also look at them up. So they're stored in the usual system and have nothing whatsoever. Remember the help I just showed you? This is the link that's going to be executed here. It's a, just a file open. So if you provided a web page, it's opening with the default browser. If you provided a local pay, uh, link, it's opening uh, with the local file dialog. Now there's a neat little functionality as well coming with Wireshark 3.0. As I said before, we have a SSH dump where you can SSH into a machine and want to capture. Now imagine there is a nice little capture interface uh, router variety out there by Unify, Unify which is called Atmax switch. And the smaller, smallest one is a five port switch about this size. It's a 100 Mbit switch, and it has a full Linux distribution on it, and costs about 40 euros. That's about, let me calculate it real quick, I think 75 Singaporean dollars, something like that. Pardon? Not even. It's about 60 bar, 50 bucks in the US. Um, the nice little thing about it is it's completely open source. And so what you can do is you create, you attach a device to it, and then you SSH into the machine, and say, I want to capture from any interface you have. But what if you want to capture from a specific interface? Well, then you can create your XCAP utility in such a way that you have a nice little reload button here. And he takes the configuration you entered, the SSH configuration you entered, <coughs> and fills it out. So this is the default start. I have just remote one, two. I hit reload configuration. Now I have a list of all the possible interfaces, one, two, three, four. This can be anything. This can be, in this case, I could start with any, uh, meaning that I start on a Linux device called any, which means it captures on all interfaces simultaneously, and then switch to Ethernet 1, 2, 3, 4, or whatever the heck the current EN0P something, S something, I mean, Linux device names are starting to get as crazy as Windows ones. Yeah. So that's neat. That's actually uh, going to be used by, by a guy named Luca Derry. You might have heard of him. He does that. He will do that stuff to his uh, capture boxes. Now, one thing I want to show you before I go into the live demonstration, show you a little bit of source code, is we have a toolbar for XCAP interfaces. Now, Remember, we have just a Python interface or a C interface. You don't have necessarily anything in Wireshark that reflects on that. So all you have to do is you have a, in our case, I think it's about 600 lines of code Python script. 
which creates a full configuration dialog, a capture interface, and a running toolbar in Wireshark. In this case, we can change some information from the capture interface. We can have it sent to us logging information. So the capture interface can tell us something is going on, something is happening, the machine has turned off, the link went down, something like that. And I can live control my capture. I can stop it, I can restart it from this toolbar. Um, I can switch to another device, I switch to another interface if I want to. Uh, I have complete control over it. And I have a button text, select a Boolean, help, and log. So I have the possibility to add additional information here in whichever way I want it to be. If you want to do, now that's about the features of XCAP. That's basically what XCAP does. That's basically the extent of it, which is quite large if you take a look at the utilities. The utilities we provide with Wireshark are all written in C. But Wireshark generally really doesn't care in which language the XCAP utility is written in. You can write it in any language you want, as long as it has a command line interface and knows how to handle pipes on the target system. So you can write it in Rust, you can write it in Go, you can write it in, yeah, basic for what I care, really, if you really have that much kind of self-hate, do it. Um, the only difference here being the execution shell. On Windows, we have this nice little problem, <clears throat> as we do execute it as a process, that Windows is not capable of looking up uh, the interpreter. So Windows can only execute straight access, CMD, BAT, and PS scripts. That's all Windows can do. So in our case, for a Python shell script, we have to create a patch file, which then executes the Python script. OK, so you have to have one step in between. Uh, but we have one small example which we provide. This example works on all platforms we use. It works out of the box in Linux and Macs. And for Windows, you have to create a batch file for, for executing it with the Python interpreter. There is a documentation in the file. It's a two-line uh, code. And it works with Python 2.7 and 3.x, just because we don't want the bug reports. Um, there is no recommendation which one to use. You can either use 2.7 or 3.x. I personally would recommend 3. Point something because 2.7 is going bye bye next year. So if you want your utility to, to endure, then use 3. It implements all Wireshark options. So you have an example for every configuration option, you have an example for the control options. And what it does, it creates a PCAP file on the fly with a fake IP header, fake TCP header, and just dumps data into it. The first thing you have to do if you create a new XCAP file is, now this is the about dialog from Wireshark. If you have a Wireshark that's fairly recent, that is, Then you have under about Wireshark a dialog, which is very big on this screen. And you have a folder section. And inside this folder section, you have this XCAP file. You open it, and you get this directory. Now, for non-Mac users, bear with me. This is what a directory looks on Mac. Uh, so this is part of the distribution. In my case, it's part of my build system. And those are all the XCAP utilities that are commonly available when you install and build uh, Wireshark on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Now, you might not have seen all of them. And the reason for that is because either they start up and tell the system, there is nothing for me here, you can close me down again, like Android dump does when it, doesn't ca it cannot figure out if there is a GNU debugger running for Android, then it just shuts down again. Or for instance, if you opted out of using the lib SSH, which then would create the SSH dump. Now there is three other examples in here, the GPIO reader we don't care about. There's this XCAP example, which I just copied over from the source repository. You're going to find it underneath doc in our source code repository. 
And the last one is a Bluetooth sniffer API by Nordic Semiconductors, uh, which for whatever reason is not working on my machine, but yeah, we stick to the example anyway. Now, Windows users are special. And they have to create a batch file. The batch file has to evaluate where is the Python interpreter. Basically, it's just a batch file with a single line in it with the path to the Python interpreter, the script file, and then uh, signage at sign to pass all arguments. Uh, in the header of xcap example.py, there is a small except which you just copy paste and fill out your paths and then you're done. So the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to have a look at the xcap example pipe. So this is what it looks like. It's, as I said, it's 508 lines of code. So uh, if you don't like Python, it's easy enough to understand. You don't have to know the specifics, but you just can read it. It's easy. Uh, as I said, in the header here, we have the small examples for the Windows users. Um, Everything else is Python 3 code. Now, the interesting stuff about it is just down here. So, those are arguments. You know, if you ever used the command line utility, you've seen this before. So, we have a bunch of arguments for their own called xcap something and two that's calling capture and fiber. Those are our xcap arguments. Those are the ones that are basically the plugin interface to Wireshark. Down here I have six, uh, six arguments that are my own. I created this for XCAP to demonstrate various features. For instance, provide a timestamp, provide a fake IP, provide a message. What I then do is I have a little bit of argument parser running, a lot of XCAP questions, and at a certain point in time, I call a file that's called XCAP capture, and all I do is I open a FIFO which is provided by the system, I write the package fake header, and then I just write my files. This isn't big trickery, there's, there's nothing behind it. I mean, if you look at the file, then you see some stuff like uh, this, which just is a little bit of tricks to create a, a TCP header and an Ethernet header and write data to it. The fun part starts at the top. At the top, we have this section. This is the XCAP configuration. Now, as I said before, we have very variances of XCAP configuration. Uh, they always have a small uh, parameter-like system, which is called call. And this is the one thing that's going to get passed to your utility. So if the user adds something which differentiates from the default value of this parameter, then, for instance, I have a minus minus D1 test. The default is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if the user enters something else in this field, you get an argument on the comment line that's called minus minus D1 test with the argument value. That's the whole spirit of it. I can have... Uh, set the name through it, I can have the description, then I have a type field, and at the end of it, I can have a bunch of configuration. For instance, here I have a validation string for IP addresses. So if a user wants to enter an IP address, Wireshark only accepts the value entered if it's a valid IP address, which makes it quite neat if you want to prevent certain stupidness to happen. When I have done all that, and I call my utility. Then hopefully down here, I have a bunch of new utilities, and two of them are example interface one and example interface two. Now those are the two utilities provided by XCAP example. All you have to do is copy XCAP example in there, and they will start appearing. And you see XCAP example interface one for XCAP double uh, point example one. That's exactly example one is the name of the interface, and the first part is the description for the XCAP utility. Now either I can do the following: I can double click on here, 
and it brings up the configuration screen because I have a default configuration that is still missing. Now this is the same as we, uh, as we have seen before. I'm here in Wireshark 2.4, so I don't have the reload functionality, but I see all the information. I see all the bunch of data I have to add in. And in this case, just write a message up here. Then I want to say I want to have a time, time delay of two. And, well, how do you do that now? I move it over here. Hit start. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. And, oh, it really doesn't like the big screen. And it starts. Then it disappeared, it has something to do with my laptop, that has nothing to do with it. So now I have a utility running every two seconds. And then when I look at the byte view, I change the message to, from the restart now. I have here a data set written something different. And this is all it does. So this is the Python example running live. There's nothing else to it. You can do it immediately after you, basically you open your install of Wireshark, you should have the accept example line somewhere around, and then you can do it. One little thing you can do is, you can add a new toolbar, which is called XCAP example interface, which is now the XCAP toolbar that already has been defined by the Python interface. Again, there is no Wireshark code specific to the XCAP example that creates this toolbar. All is done via the text configuration by the example itself. And now I can do some neat little things. You may see there, there is this time delay up here. And instead of the two seconds, I say, okay, I want to have it every five seconds. And if you look here, now it's 80. The next thing will be 85, 90, and so on. This is all XCAP does. Now, you might think, well, this is Python, it's not very useful. One thing I do, and said it wasn't a presentation for this talk, but for various reasons, not let alone security concerns over Singaporean copyright laws, uh, I don't do this part in my talk, which is 433 megahertz trace. You all know 433 megahertz, this is a RF frequency, which is commonly used by AC units, smoke detectors, power outlets, and whatsoever, to create a cheap smart home. The thing with this frequency is it's very cheap, very easy to produce. A transceiver on Amazon costs about a buck. So imagine what it costs you if you are buying it on the street in China somewhere. And it's unsecure, completely. There is no security protocol on it whatsoever. Now think about what I just mentioned, what it drives. So what I do at home, I have a utility which has a Python zero, which has a transceiver attached to it, and dumps me the 433 megahertz messages from my neighborhood just to see what's going on. <laughs> Takes about five seconds. You know, it's fun when at one o'clock in the morning you turn on your neighbor's smoke alarm. It's not so much fun when at one o'clock in the morning you turn off a power outlet which by accident drives some respirator, for instance, Phil is using, which he does. So I'm not showing it here because, obviously, but just by following this explanation you might figure out how to do it. I mean, some of you are, and NTU is, I think is the shortcut, university students for God's sake. So. You should be doing this anyway in your free time, so. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I mentioned Nordic Semiconductors before. Nordic Semiconductors has a small Bluetooth device. It costs, it doesn't cost a buck, it costs about five euros something. Uh, and that's the NRF sniffer script for. You can sit on an airport, use this device, use Wireshark, and listen in on the Bluetooth enabled devices walking by. And just so you know what I'm talking about, Bluetooth also has no security. So what you, for instance, can do, you can see somebody making a phone call over a Bluetooth headset and listen in. 
this is actually possible. This is not something you have to do big trickery for it. This is actually done in real life. So the next time you're using a Bluetooth headset and thinking, oh, well, I'm so secure, throw the thing in the garbage. Except if it's Bluetooth 5 and you're speaking Klingonian and the other person is answering in whatever else. Fun fact, do you know how the Americans secured the transmissions in World War II? Indians. Indians. Which Indians? Navajo. They employed Navajo Indians, which spoke a dialect. About, at that time, I think 5,000 people in the world spoke, if at all. And that's how they secured it. Because they knew at one point the enemy is going to crack it, but they, all they hear is a bunch of garbage and have no idea what it's talking about. And Navajo has a very hard, there's something called the hemming distance, and if you do languages and hemming distances, Navajo has a very high hemming distance to an English language. To most of us, it sounds like men. They used to call them men talkers. Yeah. There is, by the way, there's a nice Hollywood film about it. It's really good. What's the title? Pardon? What's the title? Wind talkers. The thing is, because, you know, they were used during the war, so they were put into detention camps afterwards and treated very badly. Yes. That's what you got to do. Which is not an American thing, by the way. I was going to say governments around the world are yeah. grateful. <laughs> so, if you don't want to do Python-based, you can do it C-based as well. And for that, it's get a little bit more complicated, but because doing such a thing in C can really piss you off. Especially if you go into managing different type systems on different operating systems. Uh, if you want to have a fun day, just open VS Pipe, which is our utility for doing type handling, and you see about 500 lines of code doing it on Windows and about five to it on Unix. And you know why we love to do it on Windows. So for that reason, we wrote two base helpers. And the first one is called xcapbase.h. It's uh, a header file for a C file, which you can include freely in your distribution, in your, in your utility. We tend to emphasize the fact that we stay away as far as possible from Bioshock-specific APIs. So it's meant to be standalone. Uh, it handles all the man XCAP management stuff for you, like handling the arguments for XCAP, opening up the FIFOs, opening up the configurations, handling the configurations, managing the interfaces. And it has a nice benefit for us that we can change the interface and you don't have to know about it. The second utility we wrote is SSH-based, because the first thing people did when XCAP came along is they wrote a bunch of utilities for SSH into another machine. And so this utility handles using libssh all opening SSH connection, closing SSH connection, reading from them, writing to them, and all those stuff. And to handle those, it's really easy. Going back to my sublime. So I have x space h up here. You see, we have a little bit of dependency on chillit. And we have one dependency on getUpLong, but if you have a different implementation for getUpLong, then you can use it. Uh, we define a bunch of xcap specific interfaces. Those are the same you've seen in Python. Um, and then we have our register functionality. And to use that, just taking a look at another example here. Is, this is UDP dump, which does basically the same as the XCAP dump. It's also just 500 lines long. I am searching for the main entry point. Here it is. You create the utility information. You create the interface information. You create, eh, don't change it. You create the help option, and then that's all you do. You handle your own help your own options here if you want to, and for everything else, you add, figure off to XCAP. Um, just as a reference point, when you give this to a new person, say, let's develop an XCAP interface for an interface you're having, it takes about half a day. So 
if you have a utility that generates PCAP, takes about half a day to make a wire track ready. The same goes for SSH. SSH base handles the same things, create connection, print, and cleanup. Um, you have to do a little bit more parameter-wise, but just take a look at SSH dump and you're well on your way. Yeah. That's all about XCAP. I'm well in time. Well, it's lunch next, so. <laughs> you guys have any questions? No. Got one question. Um, sure. Can you only configure the XCAP interface from the flash screen and not from the capture options? No, what you actually, no, from the capture options you can't configure it, but you can always, uh, XCAP interface, by the way, can also be used in T-Shark and TF-Shark and all the other command line interfaces. Um, you can con configure them from the command line interface. You can provide so options. From the shark, uh, you can do capture options because I have a capture open and want to yeah. capture something. No, you can't do it from the capture options. Okay. Because the capture options are put on top of that. Yeah. You can use the capture options for the XCAP capture. Okay. But they are on top of that. Yeah. But what you can do, for instance, is go into Wireshark, configure your utility, and then start the capture from T-Shark, if you want to. <coughs> if you do T-Shark list interfaces, it's going to list all the XCAP interfaces as well. And you can easily capture from an XCAP interface as well as you capture from an old network interface. Any other questions? I think you have about 15 minutes left, do I? Mm. 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Yeah. Really? Yeah. What else do you want to know? <laughs> can you build one? We can build one, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, the thing is, we were trying it. I can show it to you. I can show it to you. The thing is, it doesn't pick up. And I'm pretty sure the guy changed something. Yeah, here it is. The guy changed something, sadly, and so it's not working. And it's not picking up on the emails, so I couldn't get it running. Eh. There it is. But it's not that. I mean, if you see Bluetooth, it's not that expressive. The device basically looks like that. It looks like a small USB screen. Um, it should be working. That's the one thing. And try if it picks up now. Yeah, my my professor Yeah. But what I can show you is, it open here, yes. Could create a buffer for it. Guess what? What uh, Ubertooth uses for capturing in Wireshark directly? 
It is one of the first XCAP interfaces built. Really, it's XCAP. It has an XCAP interface. You have to install a separate Python script, which you get on the GitHub repository for Ubuntu. But you can use it directly from my Wow. I can get it running here, but I can't get it running for whatever reason on the on the main screen. Yeah, sorry. Any other question? Come to me later, and we might get it running. Cool. Yeah, I've got a bunch of Bluetooth captures. Yeah. I mean, Bluetooth capture by definition is not that interesting. No. It's a bunch of files going through, and you really have to know the values to do. Sorry. I can show it to you if you want to. Step. It's called an Edge Router X, and it's done by Ubiquiti, the guys who do the unicorn. Actually, it's pretty neat. It's just, I think it's 50 bucks now, something like that. Okay, then let's have an early lunch. Thank you guys.